And a great pleasure right now to welcome a man who's written a very fascinating book, uh, almost a play-by-play -play of a very famous event that happened 90 years ago, hard to believe, uh, this month of May in 1927, of course, the famous flight of uh, Charles Lindbergh, that's the name of the book, The Flight, Charles Lindbergh's Daring and Immortal 1927 Transatlantic Crossing. We're joined today by uh, Dan Hampton, who knows a little bit about flying himself. You also see him on uh, TV quite a bit as an analyst on the military issues and uh, on Fox and on CNN. And Dan joined us by telephone today. Dan, good to talk with you. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, great to have a chance to, to chat with you. I, re I read through the book. Always been fascinated by uh, by flight and, and all that kind of thing. And I grew up on Long Island, not too far away from Roosevelt. Field. That's where it all started for uh, Mr. Lindbergh, right? Oh, no, that's a fact. No, that's a that's a great part of New York. Back then, it was just a, an open field of grass. Became a, a one of the first shopping centers, but uh, that's where he took off. And uh, in the spirit of St. Louis, and uh, boy, you really got it down to where you almost feel like you're in the cockpit, uh, Dan. Uh, great, great writing. I know you're you're a pilot yourself, but uh, how did you do that? You almost had every detail of his flight. Well, thank you very much. That was exactly the point in writing the book the way I did was to put the reader into. The the cockpit. I mean, there's been a lot written about Lindbergh and some very good works, uh, particularly Scott Berg's uh, Lindbergh about his, you know, his early life and his later life. Very little has been written about the actual flight. Lindbergh himself is the only one that I know of that wrote about it, and he left a lot of things out on purpose because he was trying to promote aviation and didn't want to scare everybody. <laughs> You so I, I had to dig. So I had to dig around through his private papers and some other things, and then combined with the fact that I've seen, you know, the same thing that he did in, in a lot of respects over and over and over. We were able to, you know, put the book together he and I, and and give everybody a feel for what it was really like. I was going to say, in 1927, you, you sort of have to put yourself in that mindset. Uh, you know, cars weren't that old then, and you're thinking of, of you know engines on airplanes then, uh, very. Yeah, in its infancy, uh, so he really took a chance there that uh, the engines on those planes would uh, be able to make it. And you, you describe it in the book how he had to kind of monitor the, the gas, the oil, uh, the mixture, and, and all that. Yeah, he didn't have any gauges for all that. He scratched hash marks in his uh, instrument panel. It was made out of uh, plywood, and he kept track of fuel that way. Uh, he didn't have a fuel gauge because they, they weren't very reliable. Uh, very basic navigation instruments. In fact, he had to read his compass backwards through a mirror uh, <laughs> because it was mounted over his head, which, you know, I could see making do during the daytime, but it's still a mystery to me how he managed that at night when he was getting bounced around in a thousand-mile thunderstorm. But he did it, you know, which makes his feet all the more impressive. I was interested to know, or I didn't know before, that uh, the way you describe it, he really couldn't see directly ahead out of the plane. He had to almost, hey, he had to stick his head out the window, but other than that, he was working on uh, on a compass, and and I guess that was about it, right? He couldn't see it straight ahead out of the plane. Yeah, he had two side windows, but, he, you know, the, the, the forward visibility isn't really that important. Uh, I know it sounds strange to say that because most people don't know about flying. They, they equate it with driving a car, and, of course, right. you have to see straight ahead. But you have to remember in an airplane, taking off and landing, you're at an angle, uh, you know, and, and especially right there at the end where you, we call it a flare, where you pull up the nose and you land, you can't really see out of the, the front anyway. You always look out of the sides to make the landing. And, and he needed the gas. He put a big fuel tank up there. I always remember hearing the stories how they had to almost overload the plane, put gas in the wings, and of course that was something they weren't quite sure how much he needed, although I guess when he landed, I guess they said, like you described, he could have flown another thousand miles if needed, right? Yeah, he had, he had about 80, he had a little over 80 gallons left, I think, and, and, and they actually... They actually, they actually added 25 gallons to what they thought his maximum load was uh, when they fueled it. Uh, and that's that's not so strange. I mean, think about the gas light in your car, you know, when it goes on. There's always a little bit more in there than they right. they let on. And I think all fuel tanks and airplanes are over-engineered a little bit. So they were able to give him 450 gallons, which to me still sounds really scary for crossing the ocean. But, uh, you know, he'd, he'd worked it all out. He knew he could do it. Do you think he was, I mean, there's always a slight bit of doubt, I guess, but was he almost 100% sure he would make it, or, or did he have uh, even more doubt than maybe you know he let on originally that, that he'd make it across? No, no, I think he, you know, like most 25-year-old pilots, myself included, you know, you kind of think you're invincible and you can <laughs> walk on water. 
<laughs> and then that's good. Otherwise, you'd never go to Aaron F-16 or the Spirit of St. Louis. Um, he had he had some doubts, especially later on in the flight when he wasn't sure where he was, when he was trying to stay awake. You know, he, he really he really had some doubts. I, I don't think he doubted himself at the beginning or he never would have taken off. He was not suicidal. He just thought that with the planning and with the superb airplane that he'd been given and his own abilities, he could make it. And it turns out he was right. Although, you know, when you, you read stories of, you know, the Apollo 11 landing, a lot of the Apollo missions, there was a lot more danger that, you know, we didn't know about. And, and you kind of talk in the book, I guess he was under more danger or, or chances of it not working than uh, most people probably thought, right? Uh, of not making it a Absolutely. Course. Yeah, no, and, and he didn't he didn't write about that because he was again he was trying to promote aviation and especially commercial aviation, so he didn't want to scare anybody. Mm. He figured if he got across it would prove to everybody that could be done and all of his problems could be worked out later. Uh but he yeah, he didn't he didn't go into a lot of detail about that, which I did between my research and his other writings, I was able to piece it together. And the fact that I you know, I've seen it myself. I fortunately wasn't in a hundred mile an hour spirit of St. Louis but I've still seen, you know, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Ireland from the air and all that. I knew what he was feeling. What what contingency plan, if any, was there if, if he had, you know, had to land in the ocean? Or there was no way, no radio that could have gotten help, was there? I guess a, a beacon of some sort? No, he didn't. He had nothing. No, right? no, no. He didn't have any of that. He no. didn't have a radio. There were no beacons then. Radio wouldn't have helped anyway. He was... Radios were kind of primitive, and he was well north of the shipping lanes uh, because he was taking the shortest route across the ocean. Um, he had, you know, he had the bare minimum. He had a life raft uh, that he could he could blow up if he had to. He had a, a little device that he somebody had sold him that would make con that would make water out of his breath. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> kind of funny. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't have worked, but he thought it would. He had a canteen of water, and he had five sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, he didn't even want to eat at one point because. Uh... I guess he just didn't feel that hungry, but he was so sleepy, I guess he figured if he ate, that might help him stay awake, right? Make him, absolutely. The first time he ate was uh, after he'd made the coast of France, yeah. and then he didn't want to throw the, the wrapper out of the window because he didn't want to litter. <laughs> <laughs> and the landing you talk about, uh, all the people that came out to almost scared of it, uh, crowding the plane like it did. Uh, they, they were taking pieces of the plane as souvenirs. But he wasn't too happy about that part, was he? <laughs> no, but he was beyond his control then. He was astonished. Uh, he had no idea that the you know that people had been following his flight. He certainly didn't realize there'd be 100,000 100, Frenchmen there uh, waiting for him. And, he, you know, he'd never landed that airplane at night. And, he, of course, he'd never been to... Paris, so he's landing at night in a plane he's never landed before at night in an unfamiliar airfield. He's still not sure he's at Le Bourget until you know he comes in to land the last time and he and he sees it written on the hangar roof. He he wasn't really sure where he was even then. Uh, so it was a astonishing uh, accomplishment on his part. And of course, uh, you know he was able to cash in on it. Nothing wrong with that. There, there was a prize involved, I guess, when he took off, but all the endorsements and fame after that. So uh, it worked out for a monetary Terribly, right for the most part uh yeah he wasn't you know he he liked the dollar he wasn't you know he wasn't unselfish but uh the airplane cost ten thousand five hundred dollars which was a, a fortune at the time the play the uh, prize was twenty five thousand so he knew he could play off pay off the plane and have a little bit left over i think in our dollars that equates to about three hundred and fifty thousand yeah. uh you know it's, it's not insignificant but you know he wasn't doing it strictly for the money because that's not enough money to risk your life for <laughs> and he became uh, controversial you talk about it in the book too uh, especially during the beginnings of world war ii right almost an isolationist i guess he made a lot of speeches about that uh, did that kind of take away from some of his uh, fame or at least people liking him or how did that affect him yeah it, it put a dent in it for a while uh, but he you know he wasn't alone uh there were a lot of people in america in 1940 even 1941 before pearl harbor that didn't want to see us get wrapped up in another european war they figured if the europeans were dumb enough to let it happen to them again then it was their problem yeah. uh, and he was joined by walt disney gerald ford john f kennedy they were all part of the same movement uh but when america was attacked he said it's my country i love it i'm going to go fight for it and he tried to get back in the army roosevelt wouldn't let him so he he went Went out to the South Pacific as a technical representative and flew 50 combat missions against the Japanese. Uh, so there's no doubt of his patriotism. Yeah, I didn't know that till uh, I read your book. I, I figured that he wasn't involved with the war at all, but he, he did fly. No, no, no. 
know. So. He could have sat out, sat, sat it out like most of the celebrities did, and all of the politicians, but he didn't. Uh, and so people need to know that it's important. And of course, the you know, very famous uh, sad story about the the baby being kidnapped and uh, found dead. Yeah, that nobody was, deserves that. You know, horrible, horrible story, which was yeah. almost as huge, I guess, as uh, the story of him making the trip. Right? I mean, media wise, it was enormous. Yeah, and he was never comfortable with with the media and fame. Uh, he got used to the fortune part, which is understandable, but he never liked the constant attention and the invasion of his privacy. Fascinating book. It's called The Flight, all about Charles. Charles Lindbergh's 1927 transatlantic crossing, and uh, really gives you, like we said, a uh, a play-by-play -play of uh, exactly what it was like to make that flight. And Dan Hampton's been our guest. Ben, you have a, a website you want to direct people to get more information about the book? Yeah, there's an author website, Dan Hampton uh, author, and then there's a Harper Collins has a Facebook page for me. I'm, I always welcome uh, comments. Uh, I will get back to you. It may take me a while, but I I, <laughs> I always will. I appreciate folks reading it, and if you like it, review it. That'd be appreciated. Great. Dan, pleasure talking to you. Hopefully you can do it again. Thanks for being with us. I hope so. Thanks, Doug, very much. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or Doug Miles Media.